Uh, good evening and welcome to the Phil Cray Q&A here on Cape Court, the Discord server for the independence movement. This session is being recorded and will be made available within the next few days on our YouTube channel. Over there you can watch other Q&As we've conducted, like the Jack Miller, Jack Miller Q&A last week. Uh, the way this Q&A will be structured is my co-moderator and I will ask some introductory questions so we can get a better understanding of the man behind the CIAG. Then we'll ask him a few of your questions that you've sent to us over the last few, few days. If we've got any time left, then we can open up the Q&A and allow you to ask him anything directly. Uh, although we are a very pro-independence community here, we're not going to shy away from some tough questions, and there are quite a few of them. So without further ado, uh, Phil, tell us a bit about you. Uh, hi, Robert. Hi, everybody else. Uh, I, I suspect uh, most people have a good idea uh, of, of, of who I am. But uh, yeah, look, I, I uh, am one of the people behind the, the CIAG. Um, I'm, the, I'm the spokesperson, so it's, it tends to be me that, that is seen, but I, I'm, I'm far from the only person um, there. I, I live in Wellington. Um, I have lived there for 16 years. I've, uh, I come from the UK originally, as people probably pick up from the accent. I'm married to an Afrikaans lady, um, got some uh, some young children, which has led to some amusing uh, amusing escapades. Since I, since I, I'm no longer young, <laughs> so no, no, no longer a spring chicken. Um, but that yeah, that's me, and and, I, and I'm and I'm uh, involved in the independence movement to make sure that I create a better uh, a better country and a better future for my children. So what exactly inspired you to join the independence movement and what like why did you create the CIAG? Uh, okay, so the, the two questions there, I guess. Why did I get involved in the Cape Independence Movement? Um, I uh, had always had a, had an interest in Cape Independence, I guess, like most people. Um, I always figured it was probably going to be the uh, the, the, the logical antidote for uh, for increasing uh, African nationalism in the rest of the of the country. It always seemed to me that as the country uh, lurched more and more towards uh, race based uh, African nationalism, that the one problem where, uh, where where the demographics were distinctly different and that and that wouldn't be a uh, that wouldn't be a, a a political direction that would have been supported that, that naturally the Western Cape would would break away um, but that never really happened you know there was obviously the Cape party was were, were around but but there was no real traction behind the idea um, so a combination of 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 that and feeling frustrated and thinking, well, okay, how, how's this thing going to get moved forward? Um, and then uh, and then actually, whilst I uh, I'm not particularly a religious person, I had a had a uh, let's call it a, a, a calling in 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 a church. Um, uh, a couple of them where I felt okay that look, this was something that uh, that that specifically I was being pushed towards. Um, so I made the decision at the beginning of of 2020, the first week of 2020, uh, that I would uh, would. Get involved in Cape Independence, and I would give it a year. Uh, it was the agreement I had with my with my wife, um, and uh, and see where we we got to. And I don't think any of us could possibly have believed, uh, you know, what was in store in that year, or just how far we would uh, would have come. So uh, so that effectively is how I how I got involved in Cape Independence. Um, how did I end up at the CIAG is when I first got involved at, uh, in, in the independence movement, then I went and met the, uh, the different groups. So I met with the Cape Party, I met with Cape Exit, and I met with, uh, with the ULA. Um, and, uh, you know, whilst I found uh, good in all of those organisations, none of them exactly represented what, what, uh, what I was looking to, to do. Um, and uh, but but in that process, bumped into some like-minded people, and uh, we uh, we uh, worked uh, initially together at the side of of one of the organisations. Uh, but uh, but we ultimately formed the the CIAG, and uh, there, was, there was there was four of us initially that formed the CIAG. Uh, and very shortly after, there was a, there was a fifth, and then for a long time, that the sort of five of us started. But a lot of other people helped us along the way, and the organisation has 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 grown from there. And what were the initial challenges you faced when you set up the organisation? 
Um, well, so uh, funny enough, we we, uh, we we we've started to nickname it the Cape Moses effect, and I, and I would one of the things that I would say is 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 the complete absence of challenges has been the most remarkable aspect of uh, of the CIAG. So almost everything we've touched has has turned to gold. And actually, let let me replace that because that may perhaps suggest that, that that somehow we we had some acts of brilliance, which 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 wasn't the case. Um, uh, it just for 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 whatever the reason whether you whether you believe that is is destiny or or or, or what purpose i you know everybody else will have their views um but uh, but you know from, right from the start people just arrived at our door and and uh, you know it's been remarkable and it continues to be remarkable and almost not a week goes by where somebody doesn't pick up the phone and contact us and say listen uh, we'd like to do this we want to help with that um and uh, so so you know if I have to look overall, I think probably you know, funding is always the biggest issue with any of these organisations, and we and, and uh, to some extent we've you know we 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 have, we have to work hard for for funding, uh, and it's a limiting factor. But even then, we've never been out of money. So uh, you know, one of the remarkable things, if I had to sum it up, I'd, I w I would say that the absence of obstacles has been what's been most remarkable for us. Well, clearly, um, we can see the influence um, of the Sky AG uh, impacting Cape politics uh, because, you know, in the, in the last few weeks, the DA have announced that they will, you know, put forward legislation at the national level to allow for the premier of a province to call a referendum. Um, how do you see this parliamentary process, you know, playing out? And what promise do you think this holds for us independent supporters? Well, I, I think it. I think it holds a, a huge amount of promise for independent supporters. I think uh, you know. I think if we if we think of Cape Independence as a as a hundred and ten meter hurdles race, um, you know, there are going to be some obstacles. We that once we get away from the line, we're going to have to jump over. Um, and let's and let's say that one of the one of the first obstacles that we absolutely were going to encounter um, was the uh, was this issue with the legislation, which would have uh, would have allowed the ANC to uh, to stall and and stop any referendum on Cape Independence. So I think this is a this is just in isolation is, is is huge for the Cape Independence movement because it just removes one of the key obstacles towards independence. Um, but I think actually it's more than that. And I think, you know, it also is symptomatic. So there's, so there's the sheer act. Um, and then there is, of course, the sentiment behind the act. And, you know, this has been an issue that sat around for 25 years. Um, and for the uh, for for the, for the DA now to start acting upon this, and uh, you know clearly one of the one of the one of the consequences of a of a of, a, of an increase, increasingly rampant independence movement is that is that the DA have been freer and freer and freer to embrace. Um, let's call it greater autonomy for the for the Western Cape. So, uh, and they and and it's allowed them to move heavily in the direction of Cape independence, and this is very very much a symptom uh, of of that, and that bodes very very well. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people we we get an awful lot of, of criticism actually when we always have from the start it initially was criticism and disbelief um i think the disbelief has started to fall away but not always the criticism uh, for our for our sort of unashamed focus on the da um and some people take that to say, well, "Look, hang on a second. We, we're supporting the DA, which we're not. You know, we're we're a we're not a a, a party political organisation. We we support all people and organisations who push for Cape independence. So, in terms of political parties, we support the Cape Party and the Freedom Front. Um, but we we understand that, that 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 only the Premier of the Western Cape can call a referendum on for Cape independence till to at least 2024, and almost certainly beyond. That Premier is going to belong to the to the DA and therefore you've got two choices you either have to remove the DA uh, which can't be done till at least 2024 or you have to influence the DA um, and uh, you know we took a lot of inspiration from the Brexit campaign and uh, you know Brexit wasn't achieved by dethroning the the, the incumbent political parties it was dethroned that uh, Brexit was achieved by almost a Trojan horse of influencing them from within uh, and and that's very much uh, our our plan for for Cape independence that actually we will bring the DA to the point where they're at least willing to call the referendum and be neutral and, and allow the, the their supporters the majority of whom already support Cape independence to have their say and, and that's been a, you know, a very effective strategy so far
Um, your, the other part of your question was how do we see this playing out in, in Parliament? Um, look, I think that's anybody's guess. This is unknown territory for everybody. Um, we, uh, we published an article on, uh, on, on our thoughts in response. I think, uh, I guess most people may have seen it. Richard Wilkinson, who's an attorney from Joburg, who uh, he wrote an article and he uh, suggesting that we didn't really use the referendum for Cape independence um, and uh, a feeling that the DA were likely to be obstructive towards the, the, sorry, the, DA, the ANC were likely to be uh, obstructive towards this in Parliament. Uh, we responded, and I think my suspicion is I'm not entirely convinced. I think there are three outcomes. You know, I think that, that the ANC can just let this go by. Um, the ANC can drag their heels on it and, and block the legislation, uh, or they can change the constitution uh, to remove the, the right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think all of those are possibilities at this point in time. My sneaking suspicion is that the, that, that the ANC are not going to want to make a fuss over this. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a battle. Ultimately, they can't win. And I think they'll just let this slide by. I think we'll see this legislation come into play. And, um, and, and you know, the, the big battle will be, will be after that. Uh, and for what it's worth, you know, from our conversations with the DA, that's also how they feel it'll go. So the DA aren't particularly expecting a battle royale with the ANC either. Well, in your answer there, uh, you mentioned uh, some of the other political parties um, in the Western Cape. Uh, obviously, the DA is the most important one. That's the party we need to focus on influencing. But uh, Southfellow, you have a few questions, don't you? Um, you know, relating specifically to these other political parties. Uh, there I I do. That I do. How's it feel? Like to have you with us. Thank you. Okay. My apologies about sound real gaspy, but I just had a piping out Buddha boss roll and I made the smart move eating a mentor's bubblegum you can imagine. <laughs> All right. So first question. How did your progress with getting ACTP good and LG to support Cape and Pen? Uh, interesting, interesting question. Sorry, the, the line's a little bit difficult with you, so I think I've got most of that. Um, so I think you asked about the ACT, DP, Al Jama, and uh, Good. Um, so uh, look, at this point in time, um, we, we, we're not really in discussions with any of those political parties, although we would we would like to be. It's not been for lack of, of trying. There has been some discussions by other people in the independence movement with the ACDP, and, uh, and I'm told there are some people within the party who are, uh, you know, at least open to, to discussions. Um, but I mean, in the early days, ironically, the uh, the ACDP uh, specifically uh, took the CIAG and, and complained specifically about us in the, in the provincial parliament. So clearly at that point in time, they, they definitely weren't on board. Um, but I think there's a lot of alignment between between ACDP voters um, and, and Cape Independence. So my feeling is that, that eventually they were likely to gravitate across to uh, to, to, to towards independence as it becomes more acceptable. Um, I'll Jama, I really have no idea. We uh, we have uh, made a couple of, of moves. Uh, we've tried to to make contact with the uh, with the Muslim Judicial Council, um, but uh, they've not been open to discussions at this point in time. We have been on 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 um, Radio Islam a couple of times, and that was yeah that was interesting. Um, but at this point in time, it's 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 uh, yeah I, I'm not sure where they where they stand on this, and I, and I think probably their absence of. Of, of a willingness to talk would suggest that they probably are, are, are not not in favour. Um, and then good. Now, good is the fascinating one. So so uh, Patricia and uh, Brett uh, uh, are fervently against Cape Independence. They absolutely hate the idea. In fact, Patricia refused to even come on to a, she was invited on to a, a, a talk show uh, with me uh, and uh, refused to even even participate uh, because she describes Cape Independence as, 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 as a return of apartheid, um, which clearly is, is ridiculous. Um, but the irony is after the Freedom Front, the, the highest support amongst political support, uh, political voters, political supporters for independence is amongst a good, good voters. Um, so we have this slightly bizarre situation where I haven't got the numbers to hand, but but it was around about something like 70% or more of good voters wanted Cape independence, but the leadership are vehement, vehemently opposed to it. Um, so uh, so in, interesting times. We're going to have to see uh, see who yields in terms of, of, of that. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's where we are with those three parties. 
Yeah, I kind of expected that response from her, seeing that uh, she used to be with the Pan Africanist Congress and all. <laughs> so, my second question What's going on with the Cape Cod Congress? It's a question asked by Robert. <laughs> Well, so yeah, I, I guess that's for, the, the, the correct answer is you'd have to ask the Cape Coloured Congress. Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I really don't know. I, um, uh, you know, personally, I, I developed a reasonably good relationship with with uh, with Fadil, um, but I'm really not au fait with uh, with um, uh, uh, you know the inner workings of the Cape Coloured Congress. And uh, and I understand. Look, I yeah, I know they ask for people not to contact Fadil, so uh, so I uh, I haven't spoken to him for a few weeks. Um, and uh, we ha actually, ironically, we have reached out to to speak to the uh, the, the, the deputy. So waiting to to hear back. So uh, so we'll 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 see where they are. Um, but I honestly don't know. And I think you know, the, the, in many ways, the Cape Coloured Co Congress are a little bit of an enigma um, in that they, uh, you know, I always describe them as the uh, as, as 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 you know the the, the brown EFF, if that's not patronising. Um, you know, they obviously have some fairly radical politics. I actually personally really liked Fadil Adams and found him to be a very intelligent and astute politician, and definitely somebody that I could have worked with, could work with. Um, but uh, yeah, let's let let's see what happens there. Uh, yes, we had a question from uh, Yan Liu that um, you know follows nicely to these other ones, which asks, um, do you have any inside information about how the DA feels about the Cape independence vote in the upcoming elections? Because obviously I feel they will probably feel quite threatened uh, in some areas by the Cape Party and the VF+. Plus. Yeah. So um, look. So the challenge here is 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 obviously you know we we're we're a lobby group and an awful lot of our work is not done publicly. So so the the the, the challenge here is 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 what would be appropriate to to say. Um, so I'm just going to answer in very general terms, although I, I do have good insight of, of where the, the, the DA are. Let, let's just so, so let's just say that the, the, the DA are deeply concerned um, about the impact of, of Cape independence um, on their on their uh, outright majority. Uh, I think in the early days they were they were slightly less concerned. I think as time has gone on and they've got they've got other battles on other fronts too, they've become in, increasingly concerned and. I think you can just take the uh, the, the the referendum uh, act as a, as a as a as a symptom of their of their eagerness to uh, to 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 not make independence and DA supporters uh, choose between the two. We've got to remember, um, perhaps they aren't the most vocal of independence supporters, but we know from polling that two thirds of all independence supporters vote DA, and 53% of all DA voters want independence, and 64% of DA voters want a referendum on Cape independence so if, if if you have overlapping circles of da voters and uh independent supporters by far the biggest uh, the biggest overlap is between those two um so so it's highly significant and and obviously in our political lobbying one of the things that we've pushed quite hard towards the da is to say that they you know clearly they wouldn't want to uh, they would it wouldn't be in their best interest to make cape independent supporters and da voters have to choose one camp or the other um and uh, you know and and uh, sort of Say, saying too much, you know, we are we now are where we are. We're now in a situation where we have, um, you know, we have the referendum legislation being fixed, and uh, you know, and we and and beyond that, uh, we're in a situation where we envisage referendums being called once it has been fixed. Um, and uh, certainly, as an organisation, uh, you know, the the other side of that coin is 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 where we would have been very very focused on um, challenging the DA. Uh, then uh, then we clearly we don't want to let them off the hook, but we also want to respect that they're moving a long way and, and, and perhaps we've managed to create a lot of synergy between the between the DA and the uh, and the independence movements. That's incredibly valuable to, to us. Uh, clearly, we will still, you know, they're not outright supporting independence, so we won't be encouraging people to, to, to vote for the DA. We'll be encouraging our followers to, to vote either for the Cape Party or for uh, or for the Freedom Front Plus, uh, unless anybody else throws their hat in the in in the in the ring. Um, 
but at the same time, you know, we, we, we're very quick to to recognise that the DA have actually done an awful lot. Not all of it's publicly on view. This is probably just the first part of it, and there is more. Um, but but the DA have have worked quite hard to sort of try and find some common ground with the independence movement. They've been very very open to 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 you know serious and extended negotiations with the independence movement, and I think that bodes well it very well for the uh, for the future. Uh, I know you're not a representative of the DA, but we have quite a few DA related questions here. Uh, I thought that this will be the final one uh, from Yan Liu. Uh, he asks you, uh, what do you think the DA really believe? Do you, uh, do you think that the DA really believe they can win a national election in South Africa? And if not, what do you think the DA's long term hopes are for RSA, for South Africa? Well, look, and I think as always the case with here, you know, we talk about these organisations, you know, the DEA or white people or coloured people or uh, the Cape Party or the, uh, and, and actually, yeah, when you when you get down to it, there's no such thing as what the DA thinks. You know, there are obviously, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people in the DA and, uh, you know, they will have extraordinary diverse opinions within there so so i think there are people within the da who still labor under the misapprehension um that uh, that, that somehow they can well i don't think they think they can win it outright but i think they think that they can they can consolidate uh, this new center so they think they can sort of uh, consolidate a new movement in the in the democratic center which of which they would play a, a significant part uh, so and i think in fairness to them that you know they don't they don't need it to be called the da they couldn't really care less what it's called um, it, it just needs to it just needs to uh, to be to be centrist and non-racist and, and progressive um and i think in fairness you know i i, I think there is an opportunity to do something like that, but, but I don't think it's going to happen in anywhere, anywhere near enough time to save South Africa. Um, and I think, obviously, there are an awful lot of people in the DA who also recognise exactly that point in time. And um, yeah, they're in a, they're in a difficult situation. They they the you know, sixty nine percent of their vote is, is it comes from outside of the Western Cape, um, and uh, you know, therefore they you know that that they have inherent challenges. Um, but but obviously the Western Cape. Is is their is their political power base so they're so they're trying to juggle uh, some competing interests and uh, yeah and, and 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 that is difficult um but uh, but no i think the majority of people realize now the game's up uh, the game's up nationally but the majority of them leave live on the other side of the of of of, of the uh, the western cape border um and uh, yeah therefore that makes the whole you know the, the, the whole planning of the future a bit more complicated I have seen a number of uh, anti-independence, um, you know, activists and Twitter users uh, claim that if the DA were to be beaten by the EFF, the rest of the country at the next elections in 2024, then that might also force them to even shift further into the pro-independence camp. Um, but yeah, enough about the DA. Uh, I have a question here from Zhang, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, uh, but his question is more of a legal one. And he wants to know, uh, or he wants to know if you have any idea about what the legal status of the South African constitution would be after and during the process of independence. So specifically uh, content like Section 2 and the Bill of Rights. I mean, what would the you know, status of, our con of the South African constitution be? Okay, so look, I, let's, let, let, let's get a disclaimer straight up. I, I have no legal training. I am not a lawyer. Um, you know, I've spoken to, to, to people, obviously, about independence, but, but beyond that, my, my, my expertise is very limited. Um, my understanding would be this: yeah, you know, so long as we, so long as we're a part of South Africa, we will, we are subject to the, to the constitution, the provisions of the constitution. Um, obviously, the, the minute they were not part of South Africa, we're not. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's going to be a point in time where that stops. Uh, I think perhaps what's probably a, a more appropriate, uh, you know, I think, where, and where people often misunderstand the the the, uh, the constitution is that is is that people tend to sort of get very very focused, um, not necessarily independence supporters, probably much more so independence opponents get very very focused on the on the letter and the detail of the constitution as as opposed to kind of the political environment that surrounds it, um, and I. Th 
think uh, you know how how do I see the independence negotiating the constitution? Is I think first of all we have to we have to get enough support for Cape Independence that it's a vibrant and dominant movement in the in the Western Cape, and it's something that the, clearly the majority of of Western Cape uh, people now support. Um, and then from that, uh, then 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 we end up into a territory where everything becomes a negotiation, much like the end of apartheid. Um, so uh, you know, from that from that point of view, uh, yeah, I, I definitely don't fixate on the letter and of the of the constitution. I I, I think I, I recognise the spirit and the intention of the constitution, which very much allows for 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 self determination and 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 independence. Um, and uh, yeah, and thereafter, uh, they, they also understand the, the 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 nature of of you know the political environment, and uh, you know that the that the, uh, the, the dominant political will is the one that is going to prevail upon the constitution and not the other way around. Okay, let's talk a bit more about self-determination. So um, what would your opinions be? I've got this question from uh, Lexity, who is in the audience uh, tonight. Uh, and his question is about recursive uh, secession, which is basically, um, you know, after the fall of the USSR, for example, Georgia left the USSR, but then parts of Georgia split off as well. So um, would you be in favour of an allowing in the constitution, for example, uh, regions of the Western Cape uh, to secede from the Western Cape once it's independent, uh, if there's a majority in favour of those regions? Well, look, it's a, it's a very difficult question to, to answer because I think it's quite it's it's quite theoretical at this point in time. So, um, so so I think there are two considerations. There's there there are the rights, um, and therefore, and 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 then that there are the sort of the the realities. Um, and obviously, one of the key the key requirements for for secession in terms of of, of yeah under international law or let's call it international practice. Is is that the territories have to be economically viable, um, and I and I think you know. So for argument's sake, if you were and and both the territory that's seceding and the territory that's left must be economically viable. And at this point in time, it would be quite hard to imagine that there would be many territories that would be that would be economically viable and would leave the remainder still as economically viable. So you know, for example, if Cape Town, Greater Cape Town, seceded, then almost certainly what was left would no longer be viable. Um, and you know the notion of Hout Bay seceding or or Nisner seceding, uh, you know, equally, equally, you know, they're, they're not going to be viable uh, viable states. Um, and as we know ourselves, secession really isn't isn't that isn't that easy. You know, look where we are now, and look how far we've had to to, to get here, and look how far we've still got to go. Um, so uh, so you know, in, in many ways, I don't I don't see the Western Cape breaking up into smaller and smaller pieces. I know this is something that Alan Windy uh, uh, has has liked to suggest at, and say, where does this end? And I think I think it ends um, when uh, you know when it stops being practical. Um, but I mean, the reality is, if the, if if South Africa was probably governed, um, we, we you know we wouldn't have an independence movement. You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We're having this conversation because we're trying to we're trying to escape. Uh, from from a government to which we're ideologically distinct and we can't control and it's busy committing suicide um, we, as a country so we, you know we, I, I can't see the circumstances in the in the in the western cape you know uh, being conducive to 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 much greater uh, uh, breaking apart um i think what's more likely enough is is that people would um uh, that, you know Perhaps, you know, when we, you know, I think for us, the, the CIAG, you know, we kind of have re have remained quite neutral on the whole Canton system. Um, but I think, you know, a, 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 yeah, if you wanted to go that route, then that would probably be more, uh, that would probably be more practical enough um, to, uh, you know, to, ha to have a sort of a confederacy, perhaps, rather than, uh, than um, uh, breaking up into more sovereign states. I think that's unlikely. But, but should the right exist? I I don't know. Certainly, the right to self determination has to exist, uh, you know, and uh, and 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 uh, so self determination will absolutely be a right. Your answers, you know, perfectly, you know, move on to my next question that I'm going to ask. So, um, assuming that um, you know the Western Cape votes for independence in a referendum, you know, how would we go about, you know, uh, choosing the style of government uh, that would, you know govern us. So, for example, we know that the Cape, uh, that Cape Exit and the Cape Party are strong believers in direct democracy 
and uh, you know a, a confederal system you know the you know the uh, cape exit have set up a, a canton in a table view but you know groups like the da might be more inclined to have a sort of you know traditional democracy if you can call it a traditional representative democracy um so do you have any under ideas on how some sort of you know compromise will be reached in this um you know transition period when we go from being a part of south africa to an independent country Sure. So, so I, look, I, you know, clearly, I can only speculate along with everybody else. But I think, you know, let 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 let's look at what the likely scenario is. So let let's look at the what I would think the likely scenario to be. The referendum acts gets passed in the in the next six to twelve months, um, and you know, let's say twelve months after that, we have a referendum which includes a question on Cape independence. Um, so, so in 24 months' time, we have a referendum on Cape independence, and um, let's let's at this for the for the sake of making this argument uh, easier, let's assume that the only question on the ballot box is ballot paper is 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 Cape independence, and we carry that, and and now there's a mandate for Cape independence in two years' time. At that point in time. The, the 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 DA is still going to be the government of the Western Cape. They still are going to be in control of the of the process. Um, but but one would hope and, and expect actually. I, I don't think there's any, any likelihood that they wouldn't. And uh, clearly at that point in time, if there's now a mandate for for, for Cape independence, then then they're going to want to bring uh, all of the various independence movements in and the people who fought for that mandate and to create an inclusive. Uh, 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 council let's call it or government of of, of unity uh, to to negotiate uh, the the terms of of independence from from south africa um and i think at that point in time i think all of these groups are likely to have a say but i think it's but i think we have to be realistic and realize that the absolute dominant force in that in that uh, yeah that that organization is going to be the the da and everybody else effectively is going to be there at the da's grace and favor um so I think the uh, the the um, influence of of the of the other groups are going to be you know limited, um, but I think that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know it doesn't necessarily mean for argument's sake that the the DA themselves wouldn't favour a Canton system. I think you know that for example the DA always wanted a federal sort of the, the 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 DP I think it was before uh, always wanted a federal system in South Africa. So the system we've got now isn't the system that the DA wanted. It was the system that the DA got. Um, so I think you know th th there can be some sens sens sensible discussions there, and I think ultimately that group of people will have to put together um, uh, a constitution, um, and you know you would you would hope, and perhaps there would be other referendums in that period of time, or certainly forms of consultation with the people of the Western Cape, so that uh, so that we can get some understanding of of what system uh, people want, and I think ultimately that has to be something that would be the uh, that would have to be something that would be would be decided. By by the uh, the people of the of the Western Cape in con in conjunction with the with the politicians. Uh, just a message to the audience: uh, if you have any questions you would like to have answered, uh, either you know there's a button at the bottom of your screen that allows you to request to speak, or you can uh, request in general. Uh, so, um, Phil, I've got uh, speaking of obvious yeah. questions, someone asked me. Someone gave me this question. What, uh, Phil. Sure. What's your organization structure? So as in, how does the CIG work? How are decisions made and so on? Um, okay, good question. So we 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 kind of we we have a we have a, a an exco an executive committee, um, which uh, which is which is so we've got the original founders of 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 whom there are four of us. Um, th then on that on on that committee, um, then there are about another six. Uh, people who 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 form a, a part of that um uh, and then beyond that then we then we have kind of working groups uh, everybody's uh, volunteer um and you know so we kind of have a tech group and we have a social media group and we have a and we've got a lot of people who have been very good at, at helping us so it, so we've got this wider group of people who who we call upon whenever we you know whenever we we need something we want to make a video we go to the video maker we want to do something on the website we go to the web guy um but uh, but but in in that core group, then then you know, what we've done is it's it obviously with with a with a not for profit um, and volunteers. It's it's an interesting organisational structure and one that was very new to me. Um, you know, you don't have this corporate structure where somebody's in charge and tells everybody else what to do and everybody else does as they're told, because clearly that doesn't work when everybody's volu volunteers. And and what we've uh, I think at one point. Um, 
uh, uh, one of the, the the guys named it, uh, uh, distributed effort, and 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 it, and it, it kind of stuck. So to, so typically in terms of us, we've all got our particular personalities and strengths. So we all gravitate to certain areas. Um, so for example, um, you know, I tend to lead the the political strategy. I tend to do most of the 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 the, the PR stuff and the writing, and I, and and I lead most of the negotiations of the political parties. I've got a, other colleagues who who very operationally sound and and do a lot of the operation. You've got somebody else that would do the fundraising, um, and 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 therefore, and they're not clearly defined roles, but but they're the roles that we fall into and that kind of suit us. And often, when new people come along, and it happens all the time, um, then uh, then then our first question is, well, you know, people come and say, listen, I'd like to help, and our first question is, well, fantastic, what would you like to do? Um, and often people come and say, well, look, you know what, I, I kind of, I, you know what, I would love to do merchandise, and we would say, well, fantastic. Then away you go, you you you. you do merchandise and we and so we very much let people kind of follow their own their their own uh, paths and um, which has been a really successful way of, of of doing it but obviously we've got a we've got a, a, a core and fundamental uh, a, a strategy we've you know that's kind of written down it's not a complicated thing but it's kind of a, a two-pager that says look this is what the organization is about and that sort of uh, you know uh, um unregimented uh, but 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 compartmentalization makes it much easier so for example if we are on you know if, if it's a matter of 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 political strategy or decision making uh, you know it would be something that will be discussed on the exco but i mean because that would be my area then i would naturally take the lead uh, if it's if it's you know on a fundraising matter uh, the the fundraising person would take the lead if it's on a technical matter the tech person will take the lead and we'll often all have input on big decisions um not so much on small smaller ones uh, but the, but the person who's filled it is just leads and we, we notionally have a, a leader but I mean there just isn't any pulling rank there never has been um that you know that, that's not the way that we work you know we've got we've, we, we finally tuned uh, to, to to what we want to achieve we're very clear on our on, on our strategy and it's really yeah it all, all goes along remarkably smoothly okay so um you know if we're talking about the ciag what is the ciag's plans over the next you know one to two years uh like what what does the organization hope to achieve in this time frame well i, I think so i think for, for for us you know that there are there are look obviously there are there are minor objectives but let's look at the major objectives so the first the first and primary objective of of um of the ciag uh, well you know the the, the the ultimate objective was to secure a referendum um, and uh, you know we we haven't uh, we haven't done that yet, but but we're a long way down the route. And I really do believe that this process now uh, will end up in a referendum for Cape Independence. So I so I think we're firmly on that track. But we but but we absolutely mustn't um, we mustn't let up. I often think I I, I, I guess everybody here has watched the uh, the the um, Shawshank Redemption. Um, but I always think of that scene where where Andy Dupre has been writing his one letter a week to get uh, to get um, uh, library books for sort of four or five years, and eventually they get so sick of him that they send they send for sort of a few boxes of secondhand books down to shut him up and think that'll be the end of it. At which point he then starts writing two letters a week uh, and starts being even more of a pain in the neck to, to get more. And I think in many ways that's where we are in the independence movement. We've pushed really hard. We've now got this major concession out of the, 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 the DA. We've changed the political landscape to the point where the space for independence has really opened up. Um, and all of those things are phenomenal. And, yeah, and, and we're, at the, we're at the threshold. Yeah, we're, at the, we're, at, we're at the point of crossing that threshold and getting the, the referendum. Now is the time that we have to double down and, and increase the pressure to, uh, to make sure that, that follows through and does turn into a referendum for Cape Independence. And it is something that we win. So I think that's the immediate focus and I think obviously once we've got the referendum uh, you know once we have a date for the referendum then obviously you're having a campaign to to win the referendum will be will become absolutely massive um, and then obviously after in the in the post referendum environment there's going to be new tasks too but I mean for now let's let let's say the sort of the, the getting and winning a referendum is that is the, is the main objective and everything else that we do kind of feeds into that uh, and and for us yeah, you know, initially the biggest part of that uh, was was opening up the political space, uh, getting Cape Independence in the media, um, and uh, and then being able to 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 leverage that with the political parties to uh, to, to try and get some gain. Um, 
and you can you know and i think you can see now one of the nice things is you know in the early days if you go back you'll see that the only person really writing in the media about cape independence was me uh now almost a, a, you know a, a day doesn't go by without somebody having written about cape independence and it's you know it's absolutely uh, uh fantastic and whether they're for against undecided doesn't really matter you know there's more and more voices uh coming into 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 cape independence you know and and, and you know for context uh I often quote this figure in 2019 if you google cape independence in 2019 i found four articles well i mean there's probably been 20 articles on cape independence in the last two weeks um yeah and that's the level of change that that, that has come forward and, and and, you know it's it's certainly the whole movement that's done that's not just the ciag um but that very much you know we we very much came with this media strategy and that's been very successful and obviously that's something we 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 absolutely got to keep on with well we can see that you know so you can see that we're um you know disturbing the um you know the comfort of some of these um anti independence journalists um, you know, we had the editor of the Cape Times, well, the former editor of the Cape Times and the Cape Argus, you know, spending all of yesterday afternoon and all of this morning, you know, attacking us, but also at the same time <laughs> trying to pretend as if we're some irrelevant fringe movement that plays no influence in the Cape politics. So clearly we are starting to make them a bit nervous, uh, which is which is great to see. Um, so we've got a number of people watching us tonight. What do you say to the audience? What do you think? What does the audience have to do uh, in order to get independence? Because we've got a large you know, following now, you know, and according to the poll conducted last year, and we know you're fundraising for a new one, we know we have a million people you know, in the Cape that supports independence already. What should they do in order to you know, achieve this goal we've got? OK, so what do, what, what, what do we do? So let's so let's first of all, give some recognition to the other groups that are in the in the in in the in the, the space. So, so so first of all, they must go and give a mandate to Cape uh, exit if they haven't. I guess most people have that would be in this group, but actually and they must make sure everybody they know goes and gives a mandate to Cape exit. Then, then we're in election year. They must go when, when we vote this year. Look, obviously, if people vote for the for the DA, we, we you now we can't stop them. But I, but we would definitely prefer people to vote for a for a party that openly supports independence. Um, so and we when we would ask people to go and vote for either the Cape Party or the Freedom Front Plus, whichever one kind of floats their boat the more. Um, but when it comes so so that then then beyond that what do you do and i and i and i think yeah probably the great unknown here is the great the great and we definitely want to include it in our next poll we didn't ask it in our last poll and, I, and to my great regret actually it was the one the one question that we really missed uh, missed out on which is which is have you ever heard of cape independence and i think one of, we're definitely going to ask that in our next poll and i think we're going to to be, find it quite surprising that for arguments like maybe 50 or 60 percent of the western cape population have just never heard of cape independence might even be higher um, so that that really is the the biggest challenge we know that people eventually come round to cape independence you know once the idea is on the table yeah you know, even if they start out against it at some point just the sheer logic eventually weighs down on them and we've seen that time and time and time again with 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 commentators who were opposed to it and then became neutral and then ended up supporting it and i can think of several who've you know who've done that um so I, so I think the key thing for people is just to get that message out there. You know, just just hammer it on on their you know on their social medias to, at, at Bryce. You know, for 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 if you if you if you're in these countries that actually have got independence, you know, then it then it must be the conversation that's at every meal, that's at every Bry, that's at work, that's the, in the in the the canteen at lunchtime. And we're not there. If we're honest with ourselves, we're not there yet. We've got to be very careful that we don't, you know. Let's pat ourselves all on our backs in 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 the sort of the Cape Independence echo chamber, and um, where we are, you know, w where we f all only talking to people who support Cape Independence and, and know all about it. Um, we actually got to realise that the that the, the, the there's a whole world of people out there who either have never heard of it or have no idea that that that, that we really are serious about this, uh, and that and that's something that every single Cape Independence supporter can do something about. Um, and that probably is the biggest challenge, just getting people out there and and um, 
in my earlier life, I was uh, yeah, I was a, a sales manager and did a lot of sales training. And, and one of the one of the things I always tried to get into salespeople is look, you know what? Don't always focus on a yes. You haven't got to get every customer to say yes. What you have to do is you have to get every customer to make a decision. And if you make every customer you ever come across choose yes or no, you haven't got to worry about the no's because there'll be enough yeses for you to make a living. You know, it's the people. It's leaving people just undecided that are the problem. And I think that would be the same lesson for Cape Independence. It doesn't matter. We haven't got to convince every person in the country to support independence. If people are against it, so what? It's fine. You know, what we really have to do is introduce the concept to everybody in the Western Cape and, and force them into making a decision, whether it's a good idea or, or not, and trust that the logic eventually will weigh upon them as it's weighed upon all of us. Yes, um, you, you spoke about the, the, the poll there, <coughs> and the thing about the poll that I... Um, was you know because we get thirty six with the thirty six percent figure in the poll, it just makes you wonder if we, for example, were able to you know get the message out to everyone in the Cape, you know how many people would support independence then? We could possibly uh, get above that you know fifty percent figure because when I've done campaigning, um, you know in the Rebec Valley, uh, I targeted an area. Uh, you know, half of the people hadn't heard of Cape Independence. Uh, but after you speak to the people about it, after you give them the leaflet, after they take a look, you know, you get 75% support. So, um, yeah, you know, that's the most important, I agree, that's the most important thing we need to focus on. Um, so going to a bit more of a contentious issue, um, I have some questions here from African Rhino, who asked me this early in the week. Um, obviously, you know, Hopefully, once we have the independence referendum, people would accept the result, where, whichever way it goes, whether it's a vote to stay as part of South Africa or a vote to leave South Africa. But there's always that risk that we will get, especially from some of the more extremist groups uh, on the left, uh, such as the EFF or Black um, First Land First, that they might, you know, resort to political violence. You know, what do you think should be done in the Western Cape in order to, you know, contend with that? So, look, so my view is, um, look, perhaps I'm perhaps I'm, I'm naive. I'm really a glass is, is half full kind of a, a guy. So so it isn't something I lose any sleep over, if I'm honest. I kind of I don't envisage large scale violence over this. I think actually what we're going to have yeah, much in that. Yeah, much as, as 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 we've all come to know about uh, 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 Cyril's uh, boiling frogs. I think we're going to have the same scenario in reverse. I think, you know, the Cape Independence isn't suddenly going to be some almighty shock that lands on the, somebody's doorstep. Step. You know, what we're going to have is we're going to, yeah, we're going to have this campaign we're in now where there's awareness. Eventually, that's going to lead to a referendum. There's been masses of publicity around a referendum. At the end of the referendum, uh, we're going to have an outcome. If we win the referendum, then this, you know, nothing's going to change the next day. All of a sudden, there's going to be a whole load of discussions um, and negotiations. So, so, so I think there's, you know, it's going to be difficult to have any great catalyst. Um, so, what do people do? So, let's say you are um, look at Blackland first. I think is a, is a total of about 20 people. I don't think they would be able to, to, to deal with my local pub, never mind the things I haven't got about them. But I think you know, obviously the, the EAFF and and even you know the sort of the, the more radical aspects of the ANC would have greater numbers. Um, but the argument would be, well, who, who exactly are they, are, are they going to fight with? Uh, you know, after the independence referendum, it's not like suddenly there's going to be some different sign on the door or this massive people. There's just going to have been a, a, a vote. And at that point in time, I think you'll see a lot of people saying, oh, but it'll never pass the referendum, never pass the constitution and the ANC are never going to allow this. I think there'll be build up of, 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 of tension clearly around it. Um, but it's not something that I that I that that, that I'm unduly concerned about, um, and I and I think as we get nearer that, then obviously the, the, the you know the Western Cape government themselves, who will inherently be part of that process, uh, will have to start making some provisions for for security. Um, and I suspect as we start getting nearer and nearer to a country also, uh, uh, then, uh, you know, there will be perhaps organisations and there are a lot of, of uh, let me call them paramilitary organisations already in the Western Cape. You know, they, they're not they're not particularly well seen, um, but there, you know, there are a couple of, of organisations. There's, 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 I'm told there's a very sizable um, uh, coloured organisation. Um, there is uh, also, uh, you know, a kind of a, a, a sort of farm um, defence network. We've obviously got huge, huge numbers of trained security personnel. Um, we've got the Metro Police. So even outside of SAPS, you know, I, I, 
I, I think I think there's a fair bit of capacity if it's organised properly to maintain uh, law and order. Um, yeah, I think probably the, the the bigger question is, you know, what will the uh, what will the ANC government do? Um, I think clearly they would have much more capacity than your than your average citizen. Um, again, I'm not unduly concerned about them, but I think that's a question I get asked more. Well, obviously, the Western Cape has a, a, sig a very significant uh, strategic um, uh, asset. It's, it's a strategic asset uh, to the South African, you know, state. So they are going to be rather unwilling to let it go, even though it's a pain in their side when it comes to implementing government policy. policy. I think they'd get um, expropriation without compensation through far, qu far quicker if they didn't have, you know, the you know people in the. Uh, Western Cape, um, you know, stopping them pretty much a lot of the time with court cases. Um, but like, what? How should we prepare for the results of a referendum? So, for example, uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about you know the violent side or anything like that. I'm talking about for mostly the national government response because there's a few ways that they'll go. Uh, either they'd accept the results uh, immediately and agree to negotiate <coughs> with us which I don't see as too likely initially. Uh, the second option is, of course, they refuse to accept the result at all. And uh, that forces the government, in, the provincial government, into some very uh, difficult decisions. And then the third one is, you know, they'll try and act tough to appeal to their voter bases. So you'll get the ANC, you know, you know, attacking the provincial government, saying they're not going to negotiate, and then going behind, you know, you know, backdoor deals, you know, creating agreements with the provincial government for secession. So how do you see, you know, like, how do you feel like we should contend with these potential scenarios? Oh, look, it's it's difficult to, uh, to you know because obviously it's it's such a theoretical situation. It's not really been a big part of our focus up till now, and I think I know there are other people who are more focused on it than us. Um, you know, we're so focused on 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 just you know spreading the word that actually, if you sort of take your eye off this ball, you know, you, we and 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 yeah, you know, we start we start uh, you know um, putting the cart before the horse. We we you know we focused on the wrong things. Um, but I, but look, I think I think it's inherent. I think the 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 if there's a referendum, yeah, it's unlikely that the referendum will be legally binding. So I think that it, I think both parties, all parties, will recognise that negotiation needs to take place, and I think all parties will want to negotiate. They're going to want different outcomes, but I don't think it's going to be in anybody's purpose. I think you know the ANC isn't stupid enough to 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 just basically say look you know you've had your referendum and bad luck and and uh, off you go i think that i think they'll at least have uh, you know have and i think actually the danger for me is 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 is, is much less <clears throat> that negotiations don't take place but actually in those negotiations that that you know we end up with a with a with a, with a solution um that uh, that wouldn't be palatable to us and i think that's probably the bigger danger that actually too many concessions are made and and we and we you know we we negotiate away our independence having having won it um but I, but i'm fairly confident that uh, the negotiation will, will will take place and sensible negotiations yes the last thing we want to you know deal All with right. oh yes yes of course your question is not. uh yeah so so now for personal question uh are there other parties other than the acdp or the da that you've been trying to get on uh the side of Cape Independence, because, uh, like, I don't know if you know this, but there's this one party called the Independent Civic Organization of South Africa. They have one municipality, just one municipality in the whole country. It's in the Western Cape Municipality of Colorland. Um, <clears throat> do, you, uh, do you think they'd like to be on our side? I, I would I would hope so. We we haven't had any conversations with them. I do know of them, um, and uh, you know, so 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 logically speaking, um, I, I I would I would be surprised if 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 they wouldn't naturally be allies of independence in terms of. Yeah, you know, it's the, it's the one part of the country where people have fundamentally em, embraced. Uh, um, um, uh, 
getting political power as close to the people as possible, decentralization and, and actually where they've rejected all of the major political parties and and uh, yeah, gone very much for a, for a local cultural party um, that, uh, that, 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 that so that they govern the they govern their own community. Um, so, you know, that very much feels like something that would be would be logically a part of Cape Independence. But I really don't know enough. Perhaps I could be wrong. Perhaps they feel that what they've got now is 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 is, is great. And um, they can, uh, you know, they'd rather stay as part of South Africa. So it, it would be interesting to find out. But my it, my intuition says that logically, you would you would think they would be uh, they would be they would be um, aligned towards Cape Independence if, if if not following it. But it's something that we will have to find out in due course for sure. Uh, Yan Liu uh, asks another question. He's been uh, very active this evening. Uh, he asks, has any big funders come on board for the independence campaign so far? Uh, well, look, obviously, we only have visibility of our own funders. Uh... Um, and uh, it depends what you mean by big funders. You know, it, it, it have Capitec Bank or, uh, you know, um, who else? Things are Vodacom come along and, and, and given us uh, millions. Absolutely not. And, but, but if anybody's <laughs> out, out there from from some huge corporate that, that wants to, then then fantastic. Now, look, you know, our, our funding has come very much from from uh, individual donors uh, and, you know, it, what would be sizable donations. But at the same time, in terms of 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 you know, politics small donations so sizable for an individual person to give and and uh, you know for them we are really grateful I mean there have been some spectacularly generous donors um, and then and then a lot of people giving you know 50 100 200 500 rand uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis so uh, so you know we, we you know look we, we you know, we're not an organization that's that, that funded to the tune of millions and millions i i wish that was the the case um so so no no major donors but some very generous uh, very generous people uh well we had jack miller on the other week and he was telling us the budgets of the political parties ahead of the 2019 elections and the anc had a two billion rand budget uh the da had a 1.2 billion rand budget uh, and the Cape Party had a 250,000 rand budget. Um, so I think that, you know, the money is definitely going to be on the side of these larger corporations because, you know, they many of these uh, companies, because of our, you know, crony capitalist system, they do have some sort of incentive uh, to maintain the current system. They do benefit from the corruption. Um, and they'll probably, even before a referendum, like happened with the UK, you had the big bank saying they're going to leave London and go over to U Europe, to go over to Frankfurt. We're probably going to see a lot of that happen uh, before a referendum in the Western Cape. Um, but then after the referendums happened and after the process is completed, they'll remain anyway. But I, I do have a question again from Lexity. Uh, so um, he wants to know, are you concerned about the synergy between the ANC policy and that of the World Economic Forum? Uh, the president of the ANC and SA is the head of the African Union. Put that together with a DA which has a very strong national ambitions which makes independence potentially subject to policy determined in a top-down manner. Uh, how does the CIAG's Cape independence philosophy gel with slogans such as by 2030, you will own nothing and you will be happy? <laughs> Well, look, <laughs> yeah, look, that, 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 look, I think um, so. Let me maybe split that into two different things. First of all, the, 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 the CIAG only has two policies um, and uh, th those two policies. One of them is where do the borders of the Western Cape fall? And the other one is who will be allowed to be citizens of the Western Cape? Because we believe that you, know, you actually cannot make a decision about whether you support Cape independence or not if, if you don't know where the Cape's going to be and whether you're going to be allowed in it or not. Um, so, so they are our two fundamental policies. Beyond that, we don't have any policy positions, um, and uh, yeah, and actually, we've stuck rigidly to that. And and yeah, there's good reason for that. So, so, so first of all, um, what we want to do is we, we we you know we want to 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 get away from the unfolding disaster of South Africa. We want to give we want to give uh, uh, control of the Western Cape to the people of the Western Cape. And, and therefore, we can't give control to the people of the Western Cape and then decide uh, for them what it is that they want. Uh, we're not a political party. We're quite comfortable. So the Cape Party, the Freedom Front, the Cape Coloured Congress, they are political parties. They will advance particular um, party policy positions. And um, 
Western Cape voters will be able to vote for or against those policies. Uh, for us, you know, we don't. We don't favour one over the other. We don't favour one policy over the other. So, so you know, we 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 happily chat to to you know uh, the, the the Freedom Front, uh, who would be you know to, to, well to the right of centre, and to the Cape Colored Congress, who would be well to the left of centre. You know, as individuals, you know, clearly we have uh, you know we have. Uh, um, um, personal political views um you know and and but I, but I can say that i don't think there's anybody in our organization who would who would ascribe to the to the uh, we're not going to do anything by 2030 we'll be happy that wouldn't be a, a view that would be represented in our in in, in our exco at all no. <laughs> so but i mean you know it's it's going to be what it's going to be it's not our job to decide that you know and uh, you know we 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 and actually you'll see when we write often you know i've had to write a couple of articles so for example as an article that I was very happy with, uh, and, and has been useful in some ways, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, of of trying to reassure perhaps the less fortunate people that Cape Independence is 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 a, is a plus and not a minus. And it's an article entitled "The Leaving Poverty in the Western Cape." And, you know, and, and actually, literally halfway through the article, you have to say, "Well, stop, okay, now I'm taking off my CIAG hat because I just cannot answer this question from the CIAG because we don't have any policy." I'm going to tell you now what Phil Craig thinks. Um, and I probably would ironically be the the, the person that would be uh, probably the most to the left of the of the of the CIAG. Although there's nobody that's extreme to the right either. You know, we we would we would all be centrists, uh, and and perhaps I would probably be the most left of the centrists. And there are other people who would be would be would be much more uh, to uh, you know centre right. Um, you know, maybe I'm centre centre. I'm not quite sure. So if that gives you an an idea, um, then then and and, and you know, so for me, in many ways, if I, if I look at myself personally, the 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 DA talks about the social market economy, um, and that's a term I'm very comfortable with. That would be something that that for me as an individual, um, I would I, I find I find an appealing concept. Um, but I probably wouldn't risk that probably the majority of the the CIAG. Uh, um, uh, ex co members probably would be would be less keen on the idea than I am. Perhaps would be there would be more free marketers in 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 the, in the group than me. Uh, guys, uh, keep your questions coming in. They're very interesting. Um, we've got a question that's asked quite often by people, and that is over the issue of provincial migration. So Terry S says uh, or, or asks. Is there an influx of ANC supporters pouring into the Western Cape? How will this influence the outcome of a referendum? Yeah, so look, a, a very interesting question. So, so first of all, look, I, 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 I'm a person who just loves facts. I like numbers, I like data, and and I and I and I try to make it a, a, a point of of policy of personally, and also it actually is one of the written policies of the CIAG. That we won't say something if we can't prove that it's true. If we can't reference the actual uh, the, ac the actual data that shows it's true. So, provincial migration is clearly a phenomena, uh, and you can tell it's a phenomena because you can go to Stats SA and you can uh, you can look at the data and you can look at the census data and you can look at the midterm census data uh, and and you can understand. So that so, so that the actual numbers in terms of provincial migration is is over the last. 20 years, there has been about 40,000 people a year who are migrating from the Eastern Cape to the to the Western Cape. So it's a sizable it's a, it's a sizable number of people. Um, but I think you know clearly we've all heard about the, the the proverbial bus loads, you know. And for me, that's stuff that I find very unhelpful. You know, it, you know clearly the whole concept that actually there's people being bussed in, uh, in 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 large numbers and dropped off in the middle of nowhere is 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 nonsensical. And nobody's ever seen the buses because they just don't exist. That's not what's happening. You know, the Eastern Cape is the is 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 the poorest or the second poorest province with the highest unemployment rate in South Africa. The Western Cape is is the second most prosperous uh, with the lowest unemployment rate in South. Africa and the next to each other. So very naturally, you're going to have a migration from one to, to the other. And that's absolutely been the, the case. And that's not helped by national government policy, which which then obviously prefer, uh, prefers 
um, arriving migrants, presuming that the predominantly of from Eastern Cape are, are black, um, over the 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 um, indigent population or the, the the original inhabitants of the Western Cape, the the coloured people, um, through affirmative action. So look, there are some issues. There's, there, there, yeah, there's some issues there that are a problem for me. But I think we have to kind of look at the, the whole provincial migration in, in in its context. So let's let's look at the actual factual basis. Um, but the net result still is that that, that in, 19, in the in the 1996 census census. Um, the, the 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 demographic mix of the Western Cape had a, a split of I think it was 56 percent of the population was coloured, 21 uh, percent was white and 21 percent was black, um, and by uh, and by 2019 and, and this isn't census data actually this is the DA's private data or the Western Cape government's data, um, but by by 2019. Um, then, then that number had the the um, uh, coloured population had fallen from 56 to 40. Six percent, uh, the white population had fallen from twenty-one percent to thirteen percent, and the black population increased from twenty-one percent to forty percent. Um, so clearly, there is a, there is there is a changing demographic, um, and that changing demographic is 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 likely to have an impact uh, on the on the politics. You know how how people vote in the Western Cape. Um, now, ironically, uh, of course, we do have to look at that and say, well, during that period of time, the ANC's vote has fallen, even though the numbers. Of, of black residents has increased. Um, and I think that predominantly will be because of people who are just not voting. Um, that, that certainly will be a huge factor. The largest number of unregistered voters are in the black community. Um, but clearly there is, you know, the, the also, um, you know, I think we, we've got to sort of get beyond the sort of the the, 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 you know, the sort of uh, voting by proxy. It, it, it's nonsense to think that all white people vote DA and all black people vote ANC and, uh, you know, because that's not quite how it works out. So, um, but yes, so, so look, that's a very a, a long thing, maybe just just in terms of the data and for us to sort of look at the data accurately. Um, but it, but in terms of the demographics, then clearly, uh, you know, we know from our poll that, that support f uh, amongst uh, uh, black residents in the Western Cape for independence is at 16 percent uh, and, and amongst uh, white residents is about 65 percent and, and coloured uh, residents at about 40 percent. So, so, so clearly, if the, the the demographic mix changes over a decade, and the and and you, you know you you have increasing numbers of black residents and and a, a increasingly less number of white residents, then then it becomes harder and harder to uh, to get a to get a leave vote in a referendum. Yes. All right. So we got a question from Leano Three. <clears throat> All right. So we got a question from Leano Three. And his question is, uh, Phil, can you comment on the push for Scottish independence and its differences to the push for independence? Sorry, I missed that question again. Just I, I got the Scottish independence bit, but not the rest of it. Can you comment on the push for Scottish independence and its differences to the push for Cape independence? OK. All right. So look, interesting. Look, I'm, 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 I'm a little out of touch with recent developments for Scottish independence, but I can tell you in terms of the, the, the in, in terms of general terms. And if those who, who are interested, um, we, we, we've got an article on our, on our website on the blog section. Uh, you go to, 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 to news and then blog. And it's right down the bottom. Scroll right down. It's one of the first articles ever written. And it was called... Um, the path to independence, Scotland and other examples. And you'll see in there that there are some real stark uh, uh, similarities between Scotland and the Western Cape. Yeah, both of them were, 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 uh, are, are in countries that are unions of other countries that were brought together by the British. Uh, both of them got uh, provincial parliaments in the 90s. Both of them have some form of, of, of devolution. Both of them are territories where the, where the government in the territory uh, is 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 a is a uh, uh, <clears throat> the let me rephrase that. Both of them are in a situation where the, the dominant national party isn't the party that the territory uh, uh, votes for. And even in terms of populations, they're remarkably similar. Both of them are around the sort of six to seven million mark. So there are some 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 real, real similarities between Scotland and and um, uh, and, and the Western Cape. Um, so 
obviously the the uh, Scottish independence is in many ways would be the model uh, situation that we would just absolutely love to have. You know, and, and I guess that's how well behaved governments perform. Um, so in Scottish independence, you had a scenario where 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 there was a rise in in, in independent sentiment, even though it was nowhere near fifty percent. Um, in response, the UK government agreed to, uh, to 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 holding a referendum. They changed the law, passed the law to have the referendum uh, to allow Scotland to hold the referendum, and they agreed up front to abide by the outcome. So, I mean, that would be the perfect scenario. And look, yeah, what a what a dream scenario that would be for 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 the Western Cape. I don't think the obviously the South African government is going to behave itself as well as the as the UK government. Obviously, ultimately, I think it was 44.7 or 45 percent of 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 people voted to leave, and 55 percent voted to remain, and that was the that was the end of that. I know there are now pushes for a, for an additional re referendum post Brexit, and I know less about how the land lays for there. I think I think with the last few polls are, have, have been showing a majority of of um, of leave, but I've not read, read too much into it. Um, so look, but it's it's useful. It's very useful. It actually, Scotland is a great way of answering a lot of questions to people who've got queries. You know, people have to argue, well, how come we can't vote? I live in Joburg. Why don't I get a vote? It's still part of, um, still part of South Africa. Well, you you, know, you you can go and download all the rules for the Scottish referendum. And you know, the Scottish referendum, if you were Scottish and lived in England, you didn't get to vote. But if you were English and lived in Scotland, you did. It was absolutely residence of of uh, of Scotland, and the, the bar was set at fifty percent plus one, and the, so. The there were so many, so there were so many things there that were people come and say, well, you know, this should happen. You can just point to Scotland, you know, and Quebec and so on, and say, look, there's the rules. Print out the rules. That's how a normal referendum works. So it's not this is not us being difficult. This is just how independence referendums work. I hope that answers the question. Sorry. Well, I don't know if you've uh, seen the recent news, but uh, the UK government uh, has been discussing um, the possibility that they could give. Uh, British citizens who were born in Scotland but moved to other parts of the UK uh, the right to vote in a future Scottish referendum. I mean, it's possible that that could um, be, you know, a demand that the ANC tries to impose on us, although I don't think the referendum legislation as it's currently proposed would allow that. Um, but even then, <coughs> you know, most of us, you know, you know, there's a lot of support for Cape independence outside uh, the Western Cape because lots of, you know, businesses, the smaller and medium sized business owners and a lot of the tech nomads, they are very supportive of this concept. Um, I've got another question, um, probably one of the last few, unless we, and if we don't get any more questions, this will probably be the last one. Uh, but it's another question from Lexity and it's regarding when is the next Cape Independence March planned for? Okay, so the, currently there isn't another uh, independence march uh, planned. I would I would love that there were. Um, we would uh, we would dearly love to hold a uh, a march before the elections. Ironically, an election month would just be fantastic. It would be great for the parties that that that, that, that support Cape Independence. And it would really put uh, Cape Independence in everybody's minds as they're going into the election. Um, I think the, the, the COVID obviously is a potential big hurdle over that. Um, because at the minute, obviously, there's clearly no way we would get a permit to uh, to, to 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 march through Cape Town, um, and I think you know the uh, we've the third wave is in, is due to come to uh, to to us in about a month's time, um, or the peak. So it'll, let's let, let's see where we get to. But I mean, we haven't given up hope on that. But it's yeah, it's it's, it's also a bit of a, a bit of a long shot. So uh, so so it's going to be a a, a, a wait and, and see situation. But uh, but we would certainly dearly love. To to hold a, a march and the next one almost certainly will be in Cape Town and it is very much on our to-do list but there isn't a date penciled in at the moment. Okay so I'll just give people another minute uh, just to you know send in any last questions they may have. Uh, people sending in questions. I, I don't know if anyone sent in any more questions so we'll just wait briefly. people are typing so i'll just let them finish shall we take uh, questions from the audience 
Yeah, these are the final questions we're taking from them. Yes, yeah, so I don't think we've got any more questions. Okay, thank you, Phil, for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, I know this isn't exactly what everyone wants to do on a Friday evening, uh, but uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you here. We're hopefully going to be uploading this to our YouTube channel. It can often take a few days, especially when the recording is more than an hour long. This has been well over an hour. Uh, but yes, this will be made available on the Cape Cool TV YouTube channel. And I know there's a link to that uh, on the CIAG's website. But uh, Phil, just before you leave, just tell us some of the links uh, that the CIAG have. So to the website, uh, to the platforms well, okay. that you're on. Well, look, they're all on the website, so that's probably the easiest. So uh, www.capeindependence.org. Um, uh, on there you'll see and then and then but then all of our uh, all of our social media is under let's free the cape um so uh, so twitter's at let's free the cape um uh, i think our facebook one is too but actually you'll get it under cape independence advocacy group um we have got an instagram but we don't do much with it um so but our main two are our our, our, our facebook is the real volume one and 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 then twitter is the is the is the uh, more um uh, uh, what we call it should just say it's a politically developed one <laughs> smaller audience but prob probably more more uh, more intense you know in order to boost the support you really need to get a myspace account going but uh well you know thanks uh, thanks for coming on tonight um we really enjoy uh, this you know the discussion uh, yeah it's been um, great phil uh you should upload this q a on your channel it'll be it'll help us a lot sure we will i'm sure we will but thank you, thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming, uh, and to the audience, yes. you know, to, uh, listen to what Phil has had to say. Um, you know, you know, we, there was a post made on the um, CIAG's um, Twitter this morning, which was regarding the referendum legislation. Um, you know, and it's time for public comment on that. So, if you go to the CIAG's website, it should be on the blog post, I would imagine. Um, there's a new section on what you need to send to the speaker's office to get this you know legislation through but yes it's time for action so uh, thanks for joining us this evening um to the audience as well uh, it's been a real pleasure to a pleasure to have you all here